So anything you can tell us about symbolism as part of your religion? Like, I don't know, I've never been in a mosque. So I don't There's know. no symbolism in Islam. There's no symbolism. Okay. So <laughs> um, everything is for real. <laughs> <laughs> So, other than symbolism, what else? Role of women in your specific religion? Sure. Does anybody else have anything to add? Mm -hmm. So, you, you want to start with God or women? I will start with God. Okay. <laughs> First, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here. How much time do we have? It looks like you're open, huh? Okay. <coughs> well, Islam is not a new religion. It may be new for people in certain places in the world. Like if you go to Japan 30 years ago, Islam was fresh. In the United States 50 or 100 years ago, Islam started to become a household name. No, it was not. It was just a very small group of descendants of slaves that came into the United States. But uh, about hundred and some years ago, I think it was before World War I, that <coughs> factories had to close. And uh, especially in Detroit and the surrounding area, and uh, people had to go to war. And they had to import workers to keep the machines working. So they imported a lot of people from Yemen and other Arab countries who are now kind of like occupying Detroit area. And uh, from there forward came lots of other Muslims into other places. Uh, Muslims came here either as students or scientists or engineers or any other specialty. And that batch of uh, immigrants that came in those days with a worker batch. But later on, everybody coming here was either coming to do their higher education or their graduate studies and so on and so forth, or they are specialized in their countries. So historically speaking for America, you could say that Islam is a fresh religion coming here. But considering the fact that it is half the age of the United States, so it is almost as fresh as the United States itself. But for the rest of the world, almost everybody had some Muslims coming from somewhere to either work or study or do business or marry, something like this. But the, uh, the religion itself is not a religion that started with Prophet Muhammad. Because Islam as a religion is as old as humanity. You know the story of Adam and the devil from the beginning. Adam was ordered to avoid the tree, the devil tempted Adam, the devil refused to prostrate to Adam, and the devil was cast out, cursed by God. Adam was forgiven because he asked for forgiveness, and he, what else did he do? He submitted to God. Once you submit to God, you are a Muslim. In the general linguistic sense, you are a Muslim. So who is a Muslim? It is someone who submits to God. For definition within the Islamic religion, a Muslim is not only anyone who submits to God at any time in any way he wants, but a Muslim is a person who submits to God in every way God expects of him. So if God expects you to learn your faith, then learning your faith is part of your submission. If God tells you you have to earn your living because no man gets anything but what he earns, then earning your living is part of Islam. If God tells you, which he does, that it is your responsibility to develop the earth, to grow it, to leave it better than what you received it to be, then growing and developing the community is part of being a Muslim. So when you hear a Muslim saying, that Islam is a total or comprehensive way of life, it is because in Islam it is not a religion in the Western definition. 
in the real sense of the word, Islam is a way of life. Because every some everything good that you do in your life, with God in your mind and heart, and you're doing it sincerely to please God and to benefit humanity, that is part of your submission to God. So when people classify Islam as a religion, I always tell them it is as old as any religion from Adam moving forward to everybody else, including, of course, major prophets. All prophets that were sent by God uh, were told to lead people to submission to God, which means to, to, to want to love God and express your love in the form of your obedience and submission to him. Let me give you some examples of the concept in terms of the lives of the prophet. And I'm not going to throw history at you. But Abraham, for example, he was told by God to take his newly wed wife, Hajar, whom he brought with him from Egypt to Palestine, and settle her and her baby Ishmael in Mecca, then a desert arid land. No humans live there. There is no water. There is nothing. And he goes. And he submits. A few years after, he goes to visit his family. And his son, Ishmael, has grown up a little bit. And God tells him, you are expected to show your love by slaying your son in my name. What a challenge. But Ibrahim, known to be who he is, he submitted. And he got everything really to slay his son. Then the Quran tells us that God substituted that son with a lamb. And Ibrahim slaughtered the lamb and the son was saved. From this son's descendants came Prophet Muhammad. Okay? Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was to be arrested from there to be taken to the cross, according to the Bible. The Bible tells us, and Jesus took little bit of steps, and he fell on his face and prayed. What does he say in his prayer? He says, O God, or O Father, if you would take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will be carried, but your will be carried. This is an expression of submission. So the depth of submission is exhibited here in the situation that Jesus faced. He faced it with submission. He submitted his will to the will of God. So before the coffee gets cold, if anybody likes to have coffee and cream, they are available for you. You can help yourself to it. Okay. So the concept of submission, which is what Islam is, permeates everything that you do in your life. From the moment you wake up, you thank God for giving you another chance at life. By the time you go to your bed and lay your head on your pillow, you thank God for giving you a day and ask him to forgive you whatever sins you have done in the day. So you live what is expected to be a godly life 24-7. In Islam, there is a statement that says, Religion or faith is about how you interact both with God and with people. In the traditions of the Prophet, he says that the best amongst you in the sight of God is one who is most beneficial to people. People without condition. People doesn't condition that they must be Muslims or they must be relatives or they must be in my tribe or of my color. None of that. The Quran speaks to the same. In chapter 4, uh, God says, And worship Allah and associate none with him. And be kind and good to your parents, and to your kin, and to your neighbor in proximity, and to your neighbor, and to your neighbor uh, by, by chance. You know the word neighbor by chance it's somebody like him or her that I never knew before. Somebody riding the metro with me, going to their work. Somebody that I am driving my car, he is driving my car, he is my neighbor on the road. So 
everybody is, we are told, to be kind, as kind as you are to your own parents. Why? Very deep meaning that we all face every day. If God forbid something happens to you anywhere, it is not your color who are going to run to you necessarily. It is someone who is next to you. So unless you are good and ready to be good to everybody next to you, then your Islam is not clear in your head. So this is basically the, the heart and the core of what Islam is about. It is about relating to people in the best of ways that God expects of you. And that gives you the closest seating place next to the Prophet in paradise. He says, the closest to me in paradise amongst you are ones who are best to others. If this is a maximum reward, then even prayer comes next. We think that prayer is really the core of Islam. And definitely it is one of the five basic pillars. But above all of these pillars are purposes behind these pillars. So you don't do something for the sake of itself, even though it is very helpful. But it is because it leads you to something even bigger than doing what you're doing. So fasting has a purpose to develop righteousness. Prayer has a purpose to train your heart to be cognizant of Allah and respectful of his rules throughout the day, not only at the time of prayer. So I don't know if you have any questions about this or this will suffice your inquisitive minds or... Angel Gabriel is the angel of revelation. He is the one that has been chosen and assigned by God to deliver the message of Islam to all the prophets, not only to Muhammad. Okay. okay? And uh, that is his primary role. Okay. And he is called the Archangel because he is the leader of all the angels. Okay. Any other question? You have to keep coming. <laughs> Did you want to, didn't you have a question about women? Oh yes, what's the role of women in your, you guys are Sunni Islam? Well, there is no such a thing as Sunni Islam and Shiite Islam, fundamentalist Islam and moderate Islam and sweet Islam and American Islam and Saudi Islam and Egyptian Islam. There is no such a thing. These are Western constructs by Orientalists who have taken the American and Western way of the mindset. The Western mindset normally is very comfortable compartmentalizing things in boxes. To deal with them, you have to have a place, you have to have classification, and then since you have a label, give label to everything so that you can deal with it. But that is not the only way to understand anything. This is a Western mindset, and hence we get the specialization, the deep specialization, the more intricate specializations under the initial specializations, and we advance our civilization using this mindset. But this is not the only or best way to understand societies and social norms and everything else. When I wanted to understand the United States, I didn't watch movies because they painted America in the worst light. If I tell you, you will, you will never believe that that's what it is. For a young man growing in Cairo, Egypt, watching those movies, I, I, but I came. I came to the United States and I studied here so that I get in touch with the society because the only way to show respect for any culture is to really live with the people who developed this culture and they love it and they live it. So by living here, my my idea of America and what it is and what it stands for is completely different than even though not everything that I learned about America when I was growing up was negative. But my perspective definitely grew very broader than what I learned from a movie, a book, and I read a lot before coming here. I read Charles Dickens, I read Hemingway, I read a lot of people. So I was not just watching a movie like kids normally would do. I was reading a lot, but living with a culture 
is what teaches you what the culture is about. So back to your question, uh, there is no such a thing as Sunni Islam or Shiite Islam. There is such a thing as Sunni Muslims and Muslims who claim to be Shiite. And to understand this, you need to know what these terms stand for. Uh, Muslims lived under the leadership of the Prophet until he died. After he passed away, one of his closest friends that he has always forwarded as a leader to the community has been voted or elected to be or selected to be the leader of the community by the leadership of the people who were there at the time. The second caliph the same, the third caliph the same. The third caliph, however, was faced with a great tumultuous time of mobs and people who wanted to just bring him down no matter what. 86 years old, a man reading his own scripture at home with his wife and a group of mobs come from Yemen, from Iraq, from Egypt. Mind you, these are not people who flew into Medina. These are people who came walking or riding horses and camels for months on end to reach to Medina. What is their purpose? You either resign or we will kill you. And this particular person, the third caliph, Uthman, was married to two daughters of the Prophet, one after another. One passed away and then he married the second. And the Prophet was very happy with him because he was very sincere and selfless. Very selfless. So much so that when he supported the Prophet's uh, defense supply and mechanism to defend Medina, uh, the Prophet said, Uthman will never be harmed but by anything he does after today with all what he has done. So imagine a man living and is promised forgiveness and paradise when he is still alive. That's his place. The Prophet also told him, and this was one of the prophecies that, that uh, he foretold, he told him, Uthman, you will be dressed a shirt and people will come to force you to take it off. Never take it off, no matter what happens. So he refused to resign and they killed him and his blood covered the copy of the Quran that he was reading. And uh, after that, whoever the successor was available that people chose was Imam Ali. And Imam Ali was at that time too weak to grapple with thousands of people who came from all over Arabia and Egypt to kill the Caliph. And this was a, a very serious time of challenges. So one of the emirs of the northern uh, outbanks was in Syria. Uh, his name was Muawiyah. And Muawiyah is the chief of the tribe that holds the protection of the blood of the relative Uthman in his hand. In other words, he is responsible to avenge the blood of his family by putting these people into trial and applying the law on them. Ali could not arrest him. Muawiyah refused to give him the pledge of commitment of leadership. And he said, either you deliver them to me or you arrest them and establish the law on them. Then and only then I will support your leadership. Ali couldn't do it and he told him, I cannot do it. Muawiyah said, I am here in the northern flanks, standing against the Roman Empire, which comes to attack us from time to time. If they know that I am giving allegiance to you in your weakness, they will take advantage of us. So he refused. And this is where some people, in fact, most of the Muslims at the time, supported Imam Ali. Imam Muawiyah, who was in the northern flanks in Syria, he was supported by his community and some few others, okay? And unfortunately, two wars happened in this time between whose leadership do you want? Despite the fact that all what you call and even the Shia brothers call uh, Sunni, all of them, they supported Imam Ali. 
but the Shiites, which is another word for a supporter, uh, they claim that they supported Ali and that the other rest of the Muslims were standing on the wrong ground supporting Muawiyah, which is counter the written history of that era by all accounts. So this is where the word Sunni and Shia comes. Those who supported Imam Ali as a small group, very small group, uh, they call themselves Ali supporters or the Shia of Ali the Arabic word for supporters, and they called, they called the others Sunni. So the Sunni did not claim a group or anything. They were the mainstream Muslims. Mm. And, and there is a joke that uh, one Muslim scholar was debating uh, a Sunni, as, as the classical name goes, uh, was debating or was coming to a mosque to debate a Shiite scholar. So the mosque was full and as the Sunni scholar coming in, he put his shoes under his arm. And the Shiite scholar said, why don't you put your shoes where everybody puts their shoes? He says, no, I am concerned because at the time of the Prophet, the Shiites used to steal your shoes if you do that. And the Shiite scholar says, but there was no Shiite at the time of the Prophet. He said, now I can put on my shoes and leave which means the debate is not needed even. There was no such a thing as Shiites at the time of the Prophet because everybody was under one leadership. There was no tumultuous time, there is no disputes, there is no rift in the community. So that is a historic sad time in the Islamic leadership uh, history. And as you could see, it is a matter at the end of people uh, trying to solve an issue of political dispute rather than religious dispute. Later on, unfortunately, the Shiite group uh, erected a body of knowledge okay, that does not really stand the scrutiny of authenticity to support their stand with Imam Ali, which the Sunni does not dispute that Ali was the fourth caliph legitimately. But still, they make it like a, a wedge issue between the two groups up until today. What was your name? I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Shakir El Sayed. S H A K E R El Sayed E L S A Y E D. Um, I was wondering, I'm taking a Middle Eastern dance class, and so my teacher was like explaining to us how. Like in a lot of the countries as of now, dancing is prohibited. But what's like the stance like in the Quran on dancing? So dancing is prohibited in most of the countries. But do you see Indian dancing? Mm -hmm. What about Pakistani dancing? Yeah. What about Egyptian dancing? Well, what about Tunisian dancing? Yeah. What about Moroccan? What about Palestinian? Yeah. What about Sudanese? Mm -hmm. So where is it prohibited? Even Saudi Arabia started dancing, Yeah. right? But if you ask me personally, is dancing supposed to be prohibited? I tell you, who's dancing? Men dancing with peers like before war or women dancing to show their beauty and expose their beautiful parts of their body? And what is the context? Because all of these are elements. So if a woman is dancing within her family, her husband, her children, brothers, sisters, nobody would say this is prohibited. Mm -hmm. But most families do not get their daughter or sister say, can you go and dance and show us you? So it doesn't happen because people are shy mm -hmm. to do this. But you find professional dancers are dancing all over societies in the Middle East. Except in Yemen, it's not public. Yeah. Yemen is still holding to their traditions, okay? But this is an issue of culture. Islam definitely would not want me to look at any woman dancing because it's disrespectful. It turns women into kind of like objects. objects. Yes, I didn't want to use the word, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On the subject of women, um, 
are they allowed to hold any leadership positions or is that strictly for the males within your religion? Well, uh, women have always held leadership positions, uh, even before the advent of Prophet Muhammad. And it was always part of Islam that women uh, are not only allowed, but if they have the capacity to lead, they should be leading. Uh, the only question that comes as a matter of a scholarly dispute or discussion is, can a woman be the leader of the army? Can a woman be a judge? Uh, can a woman be the nation state leader, the president or the queen or anything like this? And those are matters of scholarly disputes that there is no real prohibition to tell you, if you are a woman, you can't be a judge. So as, as far as leadership, we have had Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan. We have uh, Tanso in Turkey before, several years ago. And uh, we've, we've had women leading whole nations uh, many times. So this is not something new. Yeah. The role of women and the dress of women. Women in Islam are very highly respected. We are told that women are your mothers collectively. Women are your daughters also collectively and your sisters. And you have to treat them with the utmost respect. Even the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he was asked once, who deserves the best of my companionship in my life? He says, your mother. Then the question came, and who's next? He said, your mother. The third time, who's next? Your mother. Then, and who's next? Then he said, your father. Even though the father is regarded as the pillar of the family, right? But the mother gets the, the best of your respect, your kind care, because women are seen for the reality they go through because of certain duties that they can do and men cannot do. A man can never be the mother. Can he? No, he can't. So because women are expected to become pregnant and to take care of babies and to suffer through the delivery the child care, child rearing, cleaning the children and getting them ready to go to school and all of this, women, if they continue with their motherly roles as expected, because there's no one else to take care of the kids but them, or at least there is no better person to take care of the kids more than their mother. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered men to take care of all the needs of women so that when it comes time for them to become mothers, they don't worry about where do they get their food, where do they live, how do they fend for themselves, because it's impossible. It's impossible. And in societies like ours, we are repressing women more than we think because Women desire freedom, like men, because we all come from one and the same clay, right? But at the same time, we give them their freedom at a very high price. And the price is the, the forcing of women to choose between becoming wives and mothers or between becoming professionals. And if they choose to become professionals, it doesn't mean that they are no longer wives and mothers. They are, but on top of. And this is very repressive because women normally, their energy is not always the same and their physical abilities are not all the same all the time because of the nature of women. I don't want to go into details. Uh, you can figure it out. But at the same time, so you have a woman wake up as early as a man and get out of her bed, then she or both of them have to get ready to prepare for the kids, right? And then they have to make sure the kids go to school, right? And somebody has to come home early enough to receive the kids if they can arrange it with their work. 
and that's not always possible. So you get women in poor families become totally unable to devote real time, real quality time with their children. And those children fall by the side way. Those families become somewhat less prosperous than families who have great jobs and control over their time or many businesses that they have. So the pressure we are putting on women in the Western structure has stripped women part partly of their motherhood ability and their in enjoyment of being wives as well. So the husband is a king. He goes to work and he comes home and the mother starts her homework as soon as she comes home. Unless the husband voluntarily understands and is willing to cooperate, which is not the norm in every family. So women are overloaded in our culture here much more than Eastern culture or the way the world was before the Western civilization. And I'm not blaming the Western civilization for this. I am blaming wars more than anything else. Because in America, you find also that women started to go to work in droves during the World War I, when their husbands went to war at young age and they got killed, of course. So factories and places of work, they had their wives to come. And from there, women started to become part of the economy. And the one income family is over. There is no such a thing. It's, it's history. So Islam makes it the responsibility of the husband or the father or the society to protect women for, from having to earn their own living and their own food and their own clothing by working in somebody else's place. Which you could look from a Western standpoint and say, but that comes also at a price, which means the husband's control of the wife's life and all of this. It is a matter in Islam of mutual acceptance and mutual respect and mutual agreement. This is the text of the Quran. So if you find a family where a woman is repressed, it is despite Islam, not because of Islam. It is not the way it's supposed to be. Yes. Um, how important is the history of how Islam came to be in the religion of Islam? Do you, is it mostly focused on the Quran or is, is it... Um, equally the Quran and the history, and <coughs> the history of the prophets and... The two sources of, or two resources of information for a Muslim centrally are the Quran, it's a primary text that you refer to for any reference, and the second is the traditions of the prophet, the authentic traditions of the prophet, which comes in a collection of books that are known as books of hadith, H-A-D, E-E-T-H, Hadith, which is the oral and the, the dictated traditions that the Prophet, peace be upon him, lived with, and the remarks and notices that people around him took of his life and documented in writing. So these are the two sources for our understanding of history, Islamic law, what is called Sharia, right? And you're not asking about Sharia anyway. Uh, so. Uh, these are the primary sources that we have. There are beyond that, by the way, also uh, Islamic history references that are written from early times, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we take the primary sources as overriding text okay. when they contradict what is written in the history books. Okay. Sure. Um, what about prayer? You mentioned that before. Yes. Um, do you face a certain direction? And yes. So why? Well, uh, the initial uh, prayer at the time of the Prophet, Muslims were directing their face towards Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And there is a reason behind uh, the whole thing uh, that is noted both in the Quran and in the history of Islam and Muslims. Uh, the Quran has a verse that says, 
that the first house of worship that was ever established for people to worship God is that holy house in Mecca. Then when people heard this ayah, they asked the Prophet, who built it? He said, Adam built it. So that house is built from the time of Adam. Then when they heard that this was the first, they asked, and what was the second house? He said, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Then they asked, who built it? He said, Adam. They said, how far in time was it between the two? He said, 40 years. So Adam built this first house in Mecca. Okay, and then 40 years after, he built Al-Aqsa Mosque. So these two places, that's why they are, the people call Al-Aqsa as our first direction of prayer. And then there came time when uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, after he migrated from Mecca to Medina, he was yearning to go back to the first house. And uh, the polytheists, the pagan idol worshippers of Mecca, they stopped him. So he kept praying to God to allow him to pray at least towards Mecca. And the change of direction came in the Quran itself, telling the Prophet, we've seen you yearning to a good place to direct your face in prayer. We're going to direct you to a place that will be pleasing to you. And the direction was changed. Okay, So Mecca and Jerusalem have been very highly prized in Islam because of the direction of prayer. So Muslims consider the Holy House of Mecca as the center of the Muslim world because it is the center where everybody anywhere in, on earth, when you pray, you direct your face to Mecca. As if, if you want to say, this is the Holy Kaaba, and everybody praying from anywhere in the world are directing to this. And because of the time differences, you find people all the way from the east are praying the first prayer of their day. The, then another line are praying the second prayer, the third prayer, the fourth prayer, the fifth prayer, right? And so they are like waves of humanity, all of them praying all at the same time, albeit different times in the day and different prayer names, but they are all praying in one direction, which is very unifying, very unifying. Spiritually, it is very unifying. And that continues and goes on to people who are in Mecca and west of Mecca, north of Mecca, south of Mecca. So all over the earth, you find waves of humanity. Some of them are concluding their day with prayer. Some of them are starting their day with prayer, but all of them are directing their place, the direction to the Qibla. Of, uh, Al Don't be afraid. <laughs> you, you can keep asking. You're speaking for everybody. Oh gosh. Yes. Um, can you signify that or talk about the importance of Hajj? Hajj is uh, one of those pillars that is only mandatory for Muslims who could afford it financially and physically. And it is once in a lifetime. And uh, to, to mention Hajj, one cannot talk about Hajj without talking about Prophet Ibrahim and his history in that area. Uh, you look at the people you know, moving from one place to another in Hajj, and I say, what are these people doing? They are weird, right? But everything that we do in the Hajj is related to Ibrahim's history. Ibrahim being the father of all the prophets that came after him including all the Israelite prophets that came as descendants of Isaac and Jacob. These are prophets that we revere equally to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them all. And Prophet Ibrahim is their father, all of them. So you will see in the Bible, Prophet Ibrahim begetting or being gifted his son Ishmael when he was 86 years old. His son Isaac came when he was 100 years of age. So how, how old was Ishmael when Ibrahim, when Isaac was born? 14 years old, between the two. And that's why when you read in the, in the Old Testament, take your only son, right, and put him on the altar and slay him. 
and our Jewish brothers or cousins, they say, this is Isaac. We say, how could Isaac ever be the only son? If he came second, how could he ever be the only son? So we believe that the son on the altar for sacrifice was his son Ishmael. Does this make any difference for us? Does this make Isaac less for us Muslims? No. Does this make Ismail more? No. But it's a fact of history that people have to be clear on. That's the whole point. So the, the, the Hajj is a commemoration of all the experience of Ibrahim and his son Ishmael and his mother Hajar who took him uh, when he was an infant with little food, little dates and little water. And when, Ish when Ibrahim was leaving and she asked him, Ibrahim, whom are you leaving us for? He says, nothing. And he keeps going. She asked him again, says nothing. So the third time she asked him, did God tell you to do that, which means to settle us in this land, this arid, this dry, this desert, no cultivation, nothing? And he turns back and he says, yes. Then she said, then Allah will never let us down. This is her faith. And she trusted Allah despite all the odds of reality. And she became an example of a good wife that has learned her faith well. And she is living by the guidance of God and by her trust in God. So God delivered for her. When she ran out of water, when she ran out of dates, she had nothing for her baby, she had no milk. She started running between two hills in search for water. And by the seventh time she came back, God sprang a will under the feet of her son, her baby infant, Ishmael. And when the water started to gush from that well, she started to celebrate, she got water, he got water, and the water, of course, was used to plant so many other things. And the place started to become a village, a town, and now it's a big city. So this is a payoff for her patience and trust in God. So when we Muslims go to that area and we haste walk between the two hills, we are remembering our mother or the great, great, great grandmother of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and her struggle to protect herself and her baby from dying out of thirst, and her confidence and trust in Allah, even before Allah has given her anything. So uh, that's part of the Hajj. We also rotate or revolve around the Holy Kaaba because it symbolizes submission. So if this is the house of God, our whole life, ought to be revolving around that house by way of getting closer to God. So Muslims do not actually worship that building. It's a square building that has nothing inside. It's an empty building. So when you talk about symbolism, this is part of symbolism, but we don't call it symbolism because the house is real. It was the place of the house was determined by God. The construction was made by Adam and the remodeling and raising of the walls of the house after time and uh, it decayed was made by Ibrahim and his son Ishmael. So there is the real history that we fear calling it symbolism lest the value becomes only symbolic, but it is not. So this house is central for Muslims because of the value it represents for being the first house that humanity worshipped God at the time of Adam and after until the second house was used by all the Israelite prophets as the center of their communities. Yes. No more questions. Sure. No, no, no. No, there's no need to be sorry. Uh, it seems like the number seven comes up a lot, like going between the two mountains and rotating around the Cobb seven times. You're right. What is, do, is there any significance to that or is it just purely... Anything I say will be speculative on my part okay. on, in answer to this question. 
But I can definitely note for you that God has created seven heavens. Okay. That's what the Quran says, right? That the week is meant to be seven days. And it is, right? So the number seven seems to be significant in a way, but I cannot tell you what way it is. I will be speculating if I do. Nobody's asking about terrorism. I'm disappointed. <laughs> <coughs> Somebody asked it. So, mm -hmm. what's like, obviously, like the Quran doesn't like say like you should take such extreme measures. So, why do some people interpret it in that way? The Quran teaches self defense as the only reason for you. To use arms and sets conditions forth in the text itself that you should never initiate hostility with anybody even when hostility is going on and your enemies lean towards peace then you should also incline towards peace even if you know that they are cheating you the Quran says this I'm just summarizing very quickly and briefly. The, the major text on the issue is what I said. And I can give you the, the references and everything else. But, uh, but there is no such allowance whatsoever that a Muslim would go to a mall or somewhere and blow things up and stuff like this. Okay? And uh, the, the reason we are seeing all of these pictures on TV, it is for the fact that we all know that if, if a dog bites a man, it's not a news. But if a man bites a dog, it's a big news. So you don't hear the voices of people who are oppressed. You don't have the big conglomerate companies or the big media uh, foundations, they don't have all of these resources. So what do they do? They resort to anything. I want to remind you that Menachem Begin, the former Prime Minister of Israel, Ishaq Rabin, the peacemaker, and Shamir, one of their Prime Ministers as well, were the definition of terrorism in their time. And they called it a struggle to establish a nation state for Israel. But they were most wanted by the British Empire then because they destroyed hotels, they killed innocent people, they fought against the British Empire. So the British Empire has a voice to say, these are terrorists. But do they see themselves as terrorists? They see themselves as freedom fighters. Those are the people who found Israel, right? So people's perspective and labeling each other is really unimportant when you have a cause. I believe that the United States can just take a back seat and look into some of the realities <coughs> that influence people to go to these corners. And there's a lot of writing on this issue that support what I'm saying. If we do not go out of our way to destroy people wantonly, because we want to revenge. I don't think we will reap a lot of hostility. We will always have enemies because we are a big nation and it can be a big nation without enemies. But we can, being a big nation, lessen the number of enemies and the intensity of animosity by doing what we used to do. We used to be the big brother around the corner for every nation. We used to be the beacon of every nation. Anybody who wanted to flee from any oppression anywhere, they used to come here. Now we are refusing Syrian refugees to come here. We are doing against what America has done well in the past. So America has not been protected by the two oceans on the east and the west. America has always been protected by it is generosity, it is charitable nature of the state that used to be led by people who would deal with the world by the rules of our own neighborhood rules. We treated people anywhere as our neighbors. 
and we treated the blessings of God that he has given us as a God-given gift, not ownership and possessiveness and selfishness. Now we use the grains that we export to people for political leverage. We, we used not to do that. We used to do it because people needed it. So we used to win Africa, the Middle East, and many other places just by our charitable outreach. We need to go back to those days, and that requires every American community to participate in the political arena to let our politicians know what we want, which unfortunately they have turned us into an enclosed nation living in our own U.S. cocoon as if nothing would influence us anymore until, of course, 9-11 hit and then all hell broke loose and uh, I believe we can pull back our country to where it was once, the beacon of the world. I have one more question. Sure. Um, in Christianity, you know, we have sermons and whatnot to teach people about God's word. Yes. You guys have prayer five times a day. Do you also have something similar to sermons? We have whatnot. <laughs> you have sermons and whatnot? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard you say, right? Well, that is what I said. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we have also Friday prayer, in which it is a weekly congregational prayer, if you want to call it that way, which it is. And it starts with a speech or sermon, and then prayer would follow. So we have something similar to your Sunday sermon and gathering and preaching and so on and so forth. But for the five time daily prayers, those prayers are done in congregation because when you congregate with each other more than two, three times a day, you end up noticing who's needy, who's out of work, uh, uh, who's sick and is absent, uh, who got married, who got a child, uh, who has moved from town, and who came new in town, so that you are not far away from each other. If people only meet once a week, the relationship is not likely to be as strong. So the five time daily prayers are meant, number one, to connect the individual to God more often, on a regular basis, so that I don't forget him. I don't forget that what comes in my day of blessings are all his gifts. And in return, I have to pay back. I cannot pay God back, but I can forward some of the blessing he gives me to someone else who needs it. So the purpose of the five-time daily prayer is to uh, cultivate spirituality, to cultivate uh, being observant of God all the time, to cultivate righteous relationship between the community members, and to cultivate the sense of belonging in the community and the sense of community. Thank you very much for coming. I hope this is only the first visit, uh, and I hope there is something that would attract you to come and visit with your other friends or family. Uh, this place is as much yours as it is ours. We just use it to do our religious duties and welcome our guests as well. So please feel welcome and feel that this is your place and try to come again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.